So they're not exactly subgroups, they're subquotients. So we're going to be interested in um, trying to extend various group theoretical relations between these groups and their embeddings in the monster um, and extending that to the language of conformal field theories or vertex operator algebras. And I just want to um, acknowledge the fact that uh, much of the early important work on this was done by two other interesting individuals who died within the last uh, year or two, uh, John Conway and Simon Norton. Uh, John Conway died recently of COVID. And of course, Conway and Norton are the authors of the very influential Monstrous Moonshine paper. So let me just uh, kind of summarize our results. Um, and then I'll, I'll use some words here that you might not completely understand, but I'll, I'll try to define and explain what I mean by that. So we're going to present evidence uh, that there exist sub VOAs of the monster VOA, rational conformal field theories. Uh, rational conformal field theories and VOAs are not exactly the same thing, but for the purposes here, they're close enough. A VOA is roughly speaking the chiral or holomorphic part of a rational conformal field theory. So we're going to present evidence um, for uh, rational conformal field theories that have sporadic automorphism groups. Um, and part of the evidence for the existence of these will include computations of the characters and the fusion rules uh, that are all consistent with the usual uh, conditions or axioms of rational conformal field theory. And there will be a couple of ways that um, the results are organized. One is going to be an organization by what we call monstralizing commutant, commutant pairs, which sounds like a mouthful. Um, they are chiral algebras or VOAs that generalize um, Norton's monstralizer pairs of subgroups of the monster, and I'll explain what those are. Uh, many of the results are also going to be organized in a kind of strange way by the E8 Dinkin diagram. And this organization is not really fundamental, I don't think, but it is, provides a very useful and tractable set of examples. Um, so I'm going to explain what Mackay's E8 observation is but it essentially allows you to label the nodes of the extended E8 Dinkin diagram by conjugacy classes of the monster and also by subgroups or subquotients of the monster, many of which are sporadic groups. So the sporadic groups include the Conway group CO2, Fisher 22, Harada Norton, McLaughlin, Fisher 23, the baby monster, and the Thompson sporadic group. And we also encounter um, two groups of Lee type, F4 of two and uh, a twisted E6 of two. In many of the examples, the characters are, uh, can be obtained in a variety of ways, but uh, a method that I think is perhaps particularly interesting to number theorists is that we often obtain them as characters of simpler rational conformal field theories using um, HECA operators and I'll explain um, what that involves. And I just wanna note that we build on a, a number of previous results in the VOA literature, which we tried to cite care for our paper, but I probably will be very, uh, I, I'm missing out on many of the references in this talk. And I also wanna mention that there are super conformal analogs of, of what we are doing. Uh, for the Conway group rather than the monster group that were studied in a recent paper by Theo Johnson Freud. Jeff, can I ask a quick question, please? Sure. Uh, what are these labels uh, 3A, uh, 4B stand for? So the monster has, um, I forget how many, 90 some or 192 conjugacy classes. And uh, there is a canonical labeling of those by uh, the, can you see me or just my screen? Both. Do you see me in a window or do you just see the screen? Um, yeah, I can see you. All right, anyway. 
So there's this, which is the Atlas of Finite Groups. <laughs> and this and the gap package for doing group theory calculations has a canonical labeling of conjugacy classes of the monster group. And these numbers are labeling those conjugacy classes. So 1A is the conjugacy class of the identity. There are two conjugacy classes of involutions in the monster, 2A and 2B, and so on. And I'll explain a little bit later why only this finite list of nine conjugacy classes appears in this particular observation or construction. And there is some kind of bijection between conjugacy classes and the sub-algebras? Uh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Which I haven't explained, but I, but I will try to. Mm -hmm. All right, now, um, I think Borchardt's famously said that a vertex operator algebra is something that you either know and you, or you don't and you can't explain it to somebody else that doesn't know it, uh, at least not briefly, but in spite of that, I'm just going to not try to give a definition, but say a few words that um, for those that know rational conformal field theory is be obvious and probably incomplete, uh, but for those that don't, um, Maybe we'll provide a little bit of guidance on what's going on. So in a conformal field theory, we have a Hilbert space of states and a set of operators, which are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the states. The states are created by taking the limit of operators, which are functions of Z on the complex plane, acting on the vacuum. Uh, and in a rational conformal field theory, we also have a chiral algebra of meromorphic operators that includes the verisoral algebra, but often includes more. And since it includes the verisoral algebra, that means there's a stress tensor and the modes of the stress tensor obey this uh, verisoral algebra, which is characterized by C, the central charge. The vacuum state omega here is um, SL2R invariant under the generators L minus one, L naught, and L1 of SL2R. And uh, you have highest weight modules for the chiral algebra that transform under a finite dimensional representation of SL2Z, which is required for modular invariance. I don't think that's actually one of the axioms of VOAs, but you can, can add it and prove it under certain contexts, but in physics and rational conformal field theories, we always demand modular invariance. So that means that you have characters, which are traces in the representation VI of Q to the L naught minus C over 24. We're always grading everything by L naught. And these characters under modular transformations transform into each other under some finite dimensional representation, rho of gamma. And I'll give you some examples and say a little bit about the nature of that representation uh, soon. There's also, well, Gaia is, more, to be, Gaia is are to be thought of as uh, modular forms with characters? The Chi eyes, um, as I'll explain, are modular forms on the nose for a certain principal congruent subgroup of the modular group. And then under SL2Z mod, that congruent subgroup, they transform into each other. So they're, they're representations. I mean, it depends on whether by character you mean a one dimensional representation. No, uh, basically where this rho gamma is uh, coming from. So, so rho, gamma is, rho gamma is a finite dimensional representation of SL2Z. Um, I see. Uh, any known? Which, which, has, which, has, well, which has kernel gamma of N, or gamma for a particular N that I'll define. OK. So its image is SL2Z mod uh, NZ. Uh, it's images SL2Z mod, I guess, gamma of N. Yeah, well, N of the gamma, right? I'll, I'll, I, I will define N. 
Okay. Uh, I haven't done that yet, but I'll define I'll define in. Okay, thank you. Um, and that actually on this slide, so I think. Um, so there's also a fusion algebra, which um, as I guess uh, Greg and Nadi Seiberg famously explained, can be thought of as kind of a uh, generalization of the klebsch gordon decomposition in finite group theory. So if you take a tensor product of these representations, you get a representation VK with multiplicity NIJK. So these coefficients NIJK are non-negative integers, which are famously determined by the Verlinda formula uh, using an abbreviated notation. S here really means rho of S or S. I'm using S in two different ways. This S is the modular transformation tau goes to minus one over tau, that element of SL2Z. And the representation of that, I'm also denoting by this matrix S. So, uh, and here S0N, zero labels the vacuum representation of the chiral algebra. And finally, there's some number theoretic aspects in conformal field, rational conformal field theory. The characters chi i are weakly holomorphic modular forms for a principal congruent subgroup gamma of n, where n is the order of rho of t. So it was shown by, I think, Anderson and Moore that um, in a rational conformal field theory, the central charge and the conformal weights, that is the L-naught eigenvalues, are all rational. That implies that rho of t has some finite order. And I think it's the result, though, due to Bante that the um, order of rho of t is the level of the invariance group of the characters. And just to confirm, T is the other generator of SL2Z. Yes, T is the other generator of SL2Z corresponding to tau goes to tau plus one. Thank you. And in rational conformal field theory, we almost always work in a basis where rho of T is diagonal because we um, label the primary fields by their uh, eigenvalues of L0, so we work in a basis where rho, rho of t is diagonal. Now, the, another number of theoretical, theoretical aspect that will play a role is that the matrix elements of this representation lie in a finite abelian extension of the rationals. And um, I guess by Kronecker Weber, that means that they lie in a cyclotomic extension. And it turns out that that cyclotomic extension is by primitive nth roots of unity, where n is again this order of t. So it's natural to call n the conductor of the rational conformal field theory, um, borrowing that language from mathematics. And it also follows that there's a natural action of the Frobenius automorphisms of q extended by a primitive nth root of unity acting on the modular representation which is to simply act by the Frobenius automorphism on all the matrix elements of the representation. And that will also show up in what I'm going to discuss. Sorry, the Frobenius automorphism or the entire Galois Um. Well, the specific application that I'm going to discuss just involves the, a particular Frobenius automorphism for some number relatively prime to capital N. Um, but you can act more generally with all elements of the Galois group. Um, in so, this case, all elements actually are Frobenius automorphisms. Right, but I'm going to be picking out particular ones in a particular formula. but. Yes, the Galois group. The Frobenius automorphisms give all elements of the Galois group. May I? Um, uh, what are the weights of chi i's? What are the, sorry, the? The weights of uh, these uh, modular forms. I don't, I'm 
What what is the weight? Sorry, yeah, I... the bear of level N, and uh, what is the weight of uh, guy eyes? Oh, sorry, the weight. Uh, these are all weight zero. Oh, the functions. Okay. So yeah, so I sh I sh I want I wanted to thank you for asking that because I wanted to mention that in much of mathematics, uh, as far as I understand it, which is not you know which is limited. Um, the usual modular forms that you encounter um, are holomorphic and at worst approach a constant as you go to the cusp at I infinity. And one is often interested in cusp forms which vanish at, that, at the cusps and then look at HECA operators on those cusp forms and form HECA eigenforms. But in conformal field theory, um, it's a, we're in a very different world where the forms ha are weakly holomorphic, which means in the, they have poles as you go off to the cusp at I infinity or sometimes other cusps. Um, actually, I guess in, in RCFT that's wrong. You only have poles at the cusp at I, at I infinity. And um, so in their Q expansion, there are a finite number of polar terms and they can never be Hecke eigenforms because acting with Hecke operators will always um, scale up the most singular coefficients by some power related to which Hecke operator you're looking at. So there are no Hecke eigenforms and we're always in the world of weakly holomorphic modular forms. So it's a much different world, but nonetheless, they're, some of the same ingredients play a role, but in different ways. All right, so here's an example that, that is important historically and also plays a role in what follows, which is the IC model. So this is a uh, RCFT or VOA that has central charge a half. The chiral algebra here is simply the Verosaro algebra. That's enough to organize all the states into a finite number of representations. There are three irreducible modules labeled by their L-naught eigenvalue. Um, this is a notation where you label the modules by the central charge C and the conformal weight or the L naught eigenvalue H. So there's a half zero, a half a half, and a half one sixteenth. And there's an important um, Z2 symmetry of the fusion algebra, which leaves the um, modules with H equals zero and a half invariant and changes the sign of the one with conformal weight one sixteenth. And um, I have no idea where this symmetry first appeared in the physics literature, although I'm pretty sure it first appeared in the physics literature, but in the math literature, um, it's often called a Miyamoto involution because of an application that Miyamoto made of this involution to the monster, which I'll explain in a little bit. Uh, the characters um, can be expressed in terms of the Jacobi theta functions and the Dedekind eta function. And you can use the modular transformation properties to check that the modular representation, which we can determine by its act by the representation of S and T, uh, has a diagonal row of T and row of S has this form. And um, I guess the only non-trivial thing here is to claim that uh, one over square root of two can indeed be written as a linear combination of primitive 48th roots of unity because um, the conductor of this theory is 48. Um, it's rho of t to the 48th power that is the identity. Jeff, why are there taus in the representation matrix? That's, that's a typo, right? I don't see any taus in the representation matrix. For rho of t? Oh, yeah, those, yeah, sorry, those, those, those in row of T, those are definitely, yeah, sorry, uh, that, I, I don't, I guess I was, just, just erase the tiles, and I think it's right. Yeah, it should be E to the, should be Q to the minus C over 24 times diagonal E to the 2 pi I H. Uh, so I think if you just erase the tiles, it's correct. Jeff, is so, this what's, Miyamoto involution related to sine flip of Majorana fermion in CFT? Sorry, what was the question? 
Uh, I'm, I'm asking if, if this Miyamoto involution can be thought of as a sign flip of a Majorana fermion in CFT description of the Ising model. No, I don't think so because that would, the fermion is associated to the H equals a half representation. Um, this is more a, oh, a right. sign yeah. flip of the spin field. Oh, yes, 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 yes. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, this, what, can you explain this notation L of uh, X comma Y? What is that notation? Um, so the general notation is L of C comma H, where C is the central oh, oh, okay. charge right. and okay. H is okay. the okay. Okay. Thanks. eigenvalue, and these are just the, yeah, the usual highest weight representations of Vera Sorrel. Sure. Yeah. So in this case, uh, you get a, f uh, a field extension of Q, uh, which, well, an abelian field extension of Q, which lies in the cyclotomic field of degree 48. Mm -hmm. And is it known what is that uh, field extension? I, uh, well, uh, you mean, can you write it That's in some simpler, simpler form or? Yeah, so let's say if one can describe it as Q extension of certain um, uh, irrational numbers. Uh, that may well be, I don't know off the top of my head if that's possible or not, maybe. Or the polynomial. Uh, the audience, can tell me. <laughs> just to check, is it not just adding this um, 2 pi i over 48? I mean, is it not just adding basically z to 48? Yeah, that's all it is. I mean, right. I, think, I, mean I think the answer to the question is just these entries in the matrix are the kind they're, they're, they're the numbers that generate the field extension and it looks like you have a 48 suit of unity so that seems to be the field extension oh it's the full uh, field yeah basically okay so then uh, okay and the level n is not related to this uh, field extension no it is if, if it'll it, be 48 it, it, exactly yeah okay it is okay so there okay so, I mean, in the representation, of course, I, I, I need to multiply all possible values of you know, rho of s with rho of t to get all the elements of SL2z. And the claim is simply that all the, all the elements of that representation lie in that extension of Q. So, Jeff, um, if, if this question doesn't have a quick answer, then maybe you can ignore it. But just, just because we're, we're now looking at a three-dimensional representation of uh, SL2 of Z mod 48 is, I mean, there's kind of, a, I guess, you know, 48 is not quite a prime number, but, you know, for these small matrix groups over these things, there's often a classification of the, of the irreducible representations. Do you happen to know which three-dimensional representation this is off the top of your head? I don't off the top of my head, okay. but you're, you're right that um, I think there are some, I mean, there definitely are known classifications of all finite dimensional reducible representations for some of these groups. I just don't know off the top of my head which okay. one this is. Okay, thanks. Sure. Uh, if you want, I think I could find, easily find a reference um, on that, that's, that you, looks at that um, classification in, in, the, in trying to classify conformal field theories with small numbers of characters. But it is a unitary representation. That's yes, a, it's a unitary a representation. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's a representation of a finite group, right? So it's kind of... Right. So, so it's a unitary sort of just automatically. Yeah. Yep. Right. Okay, okay so that's uh, sort of on one end, one of the simplest VOAs. Um, and then there's the monster VOA, which I guess is even simpler or more complicated, depending on your point of view. Uh, it's simpler in that... Um, there is just one character. There's just one irreducible representation of the chiral algebra, but it's more complicated in that the chiral algebra includes 196, 884 dimension two fields, the stress tensor plus 196, 883 primary fields of dimension two. And famously, the character is the modular J function. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning, 20 of the 26 sporadic groups arise as subquotients of the monster. And given that, um, I don't think John Conway ever believed that CFT was the best way of understanding the monster, but 
it's certainly the only way that I've been able to understand anything about the monster. So if we believe that CFT or VOAs is the right language for understanding the monster, it's natural to ask whether the subquotient structure of subgroups, the subquotient, the, the groups that arise in subquotients of the monster have a reflection in sub VOAs of the monster that have those groups as automorphism groups. So in other words, can we obtain a more uniform picture of some of the, of the sporadic groups involved in the monster as automorphism groups of vertex operator algebras that are constructed from this V natural that was first constructed by Frank Lepowski and Merman. So there are a number of things that I need to mention to kind of organize that. And one is this E8 observation of Mackay. So I'm going to state what it is, but not explain why it is true, because I don't really understand why it's true. But as with many things with John Mackay, he just, you know, he found some amazing connection and then we're left to try to puzzle out what it really means. So there are two classes of involutions in the monster and we're looking at two involutions in the 2A conjugacy class. So you can then check using the character table of the monster that the product of G and H lies in only one of nine conjugacy classes. Uh, 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, up to 3C. And the orders of these classes coincide with the Coxeter labels of the extended affine E8 Dinkin diagram. So I remind you that if you have alpha i, a set of simple roots of E8, and alpha naught is the negative of the maximal root, then in other words, you can express the maximal root in terms of, these, of the simple roots and these Coxeter labels that these Coxeter labels CI are precisely one, two, three, four, five, six, four, two, three, and are the same numbers as the orders of these classes. It's a very bizarre fact. And furthermore, if G and H are two involutions in the 2A class, then the group generated by G and H is a dihedral group, D, uh, well, it's D, C sub i. Uh, so in other words, the product of G and H is of order C sub i, where C sub i are these Coxeter labels. So this is a group theoretical observation about the structure of the monster. And there's a very beautiful lifting of this group theoretical structure into a VOA structure that involves icing model sub VOAs of V natural and the Miyamoto involutions that I mentioned for the icing model, which then end up acting as elements of the 2A conjugacy class of the monster. So the group theory gets lifted to a VOA structure. Jeff, is there gonna be an analogous story for 2B? No, I know of no such story for 2B. Is is there a way, Jeff, like, is there a good way to decide which two on the Dinkin diagram is a 2A and which two is 2B? Um, good question. I guess question. I just think about three or four. Yeah, there's, you know, there's a paper by John Duncan on this E8 observation that, um, I obviously don't, uh, I, well, I, I both can't recall it. I'm not sure I ever really understood it very well, but I think he tries to give an explanation involving something, something involving the structure of congruent subgroups of SL2Z uh, and um, that, are genus, that are genus zero and how they correspond to these elements. But, I can't, I, I can't, yeah, I suggest you look there because I, I don't remember quite what the argument is, but I think he may have offered an explanation of which two and which three go to which uh, nodes of the Dinkin diagram. Okay, so 
Um, there are a number of examples in mathematics where you have a group and two subgroups, G and G tilde, such that G is the centralizer of G tilde in the group S, and G tilde is the centralizer of G. In other words, they're mutually centralizing groups. And uh, two examples of this are the dual reductive pairs of Hau, where the overarching group is a symplectic group, and the Schurl-Weil duality between representations of GLN and SK acting in the group of endomorphisms of the tensor product of K copies of C to the N is also another famous example um, where these two groups are mutually centralizing. So uh, Simon Norton worked out um, a number of the structure of a number of such pairs in the monster sporadic group. And he called a pair of groups that were mutually centralizing in the monster, monster monstralizer pairs. And he has a paper that has a long, long list of examples. Um, I'm only going to be discussing or using a few of them. So a few examples that have abelian G involve uh, an order two element in the 2A conjugacy class and with G tilde being 2 dot B. And again, I'm using this finite group theory notation where the dot means that Z2 is a normal subgroup of 2 dot B and the quotient is B. Uh, Z3A with a Z3 extension of the um, derived group of the Fisher group, Fi24, and then 4A with a particular extension of the third Conway group. And then there's some examples that will play a role here involving dihedral groups, um, uh, which I've listed here. So these dihedral groups, as I mentioned, that are the ones that I've listed here are ones that are generated by um, a pro sort of generated by two 2A involutions uh, whose product is in the class Nx. So sometimes that class is an A class, sometimes a B class, et cetera. So a theme is to extend these modularizer pairs to pairs of VOAs in which you have commutant pairs of chiral algebras in V natural meaning that the operators in WG and WG tilde have regular operator product expansions with those in WG tilde, or in other words, that their modes in the mode expansion commute with each other. And this is a table that has more information than I really want to explain that has a number of the examples that we looked at. Um, but it, in each case gives um, the group G tilde, which commutes, which is the centralizer of this very simple, either abelian, Zn, or dihedral group. And you can see that it includes many of the sporadic groups, so the baby monster, Fisher 24, Fisher 23, McLaughlin, etc. The central charge of the VOA that um, has that group acting as uh, automorphism group. Um, so this is a list of central charges here. Some of them are integer, like the monster with C equals 24. This one involving Conway 3 with central charge 23, but others are fractional. And um, the rest of the information here, I think I'm going to gloss over for the moment, except to say that um, these algebras WG, um, well, I guess I'm going to say a little bit more about how they're constructed, but I'll just mention that they either involve what are called parafermion conformal field theories, or for the, these dihedral examples, they're generated by pairs of icing conformal vectors. So in other words, in the monster theory, you can sometimes find C equals a half conformal vectors as linear combinations of the stress tensor and the primary dimension two fields, but those conformal vectors with C equals a half do not necessarily commute. They might have singular terms in the OPE. 
And in that case, they generate a larger conformal field theory than just the tensor product of two C equals a half theories. And all these dihedral examples are of that form where the two uh, icing conformal vectors generate a larger conformal field theory. And the WGs appearing here have been constructed in uh, a long series of papers by many authors. I've tried to list most of them here, but I may have uh, missed a few who constructed many of these examples case by case, and in a few cases uh, constructed sort of some of these families. So, so Jeff, are these all sub VOAs of a product of Ising models? They're not a product of Ising models. So the W, w sub G is not a sub VOA of some, I, I, not, I didn't mean just two Ising models, some well, number of them. Well, let me, all right, so let me, um, let me say a few more things and then how about if you ask the question again? So I want to explain in a little more detail what I mean by decomposing the monster VOA into um, two parts that, um, or into two commutant pairs. So if you have two rational conformal field theories with central charge C and C prime, you can always just take a tensor product of the two theories and get a, a RCFT with central charge C plus C prime, and you'll have an action of the Virasoro algebra, which is the sum of the Virasoro algebras associated to each one with central charge C and C prime that acts. So you can always go in the direction of taking tensor products, but you can ask, about doing the inverse of that. That is, if you're given a rational conformal field theory, can you decompose it into a tensor product of rational conformal field theories with smaller central charge? And I think this first question was first looked at in the physics literature in an old, old paper by uh, Zamolodzikov, who of course did many things first in conformal field theory. And um, Lance Dixon and I worked out a number of other examples, but never published it. Um, and then it has been taken up in uh, the mathematical literature um, on the monster. So let me illustrate it with the simplest possible case. If you have a theory that just has a stress tensor and a primary field of dimension two zero, then you have OPEs between the stress tensor and itself, which are completely determined in terms of the central charge C. You have uh, an OPE of T with phi, which is completely determined by the conformal weight of phi. And then you have an OPE of phi with itself, which you can always normalize so that the most singular term has coefficient one. And then the only terms that aren't determined by associativity of the OPEs are, is the OPE of phi with itself giving phi, which involves an undetermined coefficient B which you have to compute given a particular rational conformal field theory with a particular primary field. So the set of OPEs is determined by the central charge and one coefficient B. So now you can try to deconstruct it into a theory with smaller central charge by asking whether you can define a linear combination of T and phi such that T plus and minus obey the OPE of a stress tensor, that is something of this form with some central charge, C plus or minus. And just working that out gives you uh, an algebraic equation which has roots C plus and minus for the central charge and uh, also determines the parameters alpha plus and minus and beta plus and minus in this expansion in terms of B and C. So you can apply this to various examples. For example, a, um, a theory of a C equals one boson on a circle at a particular value of the radius has an extra primary dimension two zero field and you can depose it, decompose it into two copies of the icing model. So this can be thought of uh, more geometrically as RCFD, well, as RCFD giving you a, a finite dimensional unitary bundle on uh, the modular curve and um, the product is basically the tensor product of the two vector bundles. Yes, and the question I'm asking here is if you're given mm -hmm. that tensor product, is there some way of decomposing it into smaller representations? Right. 
Is little t plus non-singular with little t minus? So here, in the case of just t and one primary two zero, t plus is non-singular with t minus. So this, as you can see from this formula, c plus plus c minus is c. So in this case, we've decomposed into two commuting conformal vectors. But that does not necessarily have to be the case when there are more conformal vectors. But it turns out to be the case in this simple example. So the monster VOA has 196883 primary dimension 20 operators. So you can play this game in many different ways. That is, you could take T plus some linear combination of the 196883 primary dimension 20 operators, and you can ask whether those combinations are conformal vectors with some central charge. And that has been worked out for, in many cases in the mathematical literature. I'm not going to try to give the proofs, but I'll just state some of the results. So in an early paper in this area by Dong, Mason, and Zhu, they showed that the monster VOA contains 48 commuting C equals a half icing conformal vectors. If you take one of those icing conformal vectors and deconstruct the theory just pulling out that C equals a half part and look at the 23 and a half central charge theory that's left over, then you get a sub VOA on which the baby monster acts as automorphisms. That was worked out in the PhD thesis of Hohn. And you can also show that the monster VOA contains pairs of icing conformal vectors such that their Miyamoto involutions, these Z2 elements that are minus one on the spin field, generate the dihedral subgroup, which is associated to Mackay's E8 observation. And there are a number of people that worked out the structure of these VOAs. So Greg, coming back to your question, what you do is you find two C equals a half conformal vectors, let's say T1 and T2, in the monster VOA. And you can actually characterize each of those as idempotence of the Grice algebra, where T1 with T1 gives T1 under the Grice algebra. But the OPE of T1 with T2 may or may not be singular. If it's not singular, then T1 and T2 commute, and they just generate a C equals 1 theory. But if they have singular terms in their OPE, then you generate a larger conformal field theory, and you have to figure out what that larger conformal field theory is. And in many cases, it's a parafermion theory, or it's a tensor product of minimal models or minimal models and a parafermion theory. And what was done in the literature is to work out in detail what those smaller CFTs were and what their, um, basically what the representations and characters were for each of these nodes on the E8 diagram. So these are generated. So you use uh, P squared equals four vectors in the leech lattice, which are not orthogonal. Well, that it does not give you all the dimension two operators because there are also, or, yeah, there are also dimension two operators which arises. Um, uh, dx, dx, yeah. No, there are also ones involving twist fields. All oh, right, and the, but so yeah, so I it's see. yeah, so it's okay. more complicated. Anyway, but the, it's not obvious what the conformal vector is in this case when they're not singular. No, so I, so I think if you really want to sort of study this and classify this, you have to understand some of the properties of the Grice algebra. And, um, well, that's not something I ever really want to be able to do. Anyway, so I, I guess I'm just trying to get across the message that one part of this has been worked out in quite a bit of detail in the mathematical literature. And if I go back to this slide, the part that's been worked out is the structure of the chiral algebras in this column, which um, have smallish automorphism groups involving cyclic groups or dihedral groups, and can be constructed in terms of either minimal Verisoro models or parafermion theories, which are theories that we have complete control over their characters, their, you know, ways of computing their content. We know 
basically everything about these CFTs. So our goal in this paper was to find out information about the, their commutant, the chiral algebra that is left over when we pull off this conformal field theory out of the monster VOA and what the structure is and what their characters are. So um, that's what we're going to focus on. And in particular, we're going to try to focus on computing the characters and the modular representation of the, um, the modular representation provided by the characters of this <coughs> dual RCFT, which is dual to this simpler, smaller CFT, and whose automorphism group is dual in this sense of dual pairs of groups. Um, so that's what we're after trying to get the structure of. And I'm a physicist, not a mathematician, and I'm also not really an expert on finite group theory or VOAs. So I think in principle, one could try to compute these characters directly from the definition in terms of the commutant of this simpler um, VOA, but we proceeded indirectly by trying to compute characters and modular representations that satisfied a number of very non-trivial properties. And if you ask me whether that gives you a unique answer or whether we have a proof, I would say I suspect it's unique. Um, I don't know that I would claim a proof because I'm a physicist and I don't really do proofs, but I think it would be interesting and hopefully some mathematicians will take an interest in this and try to make what we've done um, completely mathematically rigorous. So if we have this pair, a monstralizer pair of groups that centralize each other in the monster, and a pair of associated chiral algebras, and the characters of these chiral algebras are chi and chi tilde, then the characters chi tilde must have positive integer inter coefficients in their Q expansion, just because those, um, those coefficients are dimensions of vector spaces. And um, we would expect them to have what you might call obvious decompositions into irreducible representations of G tilde, at least for the low lying terms. This is not obviously a well defined term, but we'll see it when we, we'll recognize it when we see it. The modular representation uh, can be used to compute the fusion coefficients. And not every representation, finite dimensional representation of the modular group is consistent with giving um, non negative integer fusion coefficients using the Verlinda formula. So the modular representations we we find have to be consistent with non-negative energy fusion coefficients. The decomposition of the character of the monster VOA into characters of these um, commutant pairs of chiral algebras um, has to obey this bilinear relation that the sum of characters chi and chi tilde gives the character of the monster VOA J of tau. And finally, we can twine, that is, we can replace dimensions of vector spaces by characters by elements of um, G acting on the chi's and G tilde acting on the chi tildes. And when we do that, we should get the appropriate Mackay Thompson series of monstrous moonshine. So, this, I guess this is obvious. So obviously, is the Verlinda ring for WG? isomorphic to that for WG tilde? I mean, you're using the same alpha for representations of WG and representations of WG tilde. Yeah. Which is part of what's, would be um, and, and also J is invariant under the modular group, which suggests that chi and chi tilde transform in uh, contragradient representations. Yeah, so um, in all the cases that we that we you know found evident, well, we, where we computed these characters, that uh, we could show that that was the case. I think that um, this has to be true as I soon think, as the centralizers of the two subalgebras are each other. 
Yeah, I was wondering if it, it, it somehow follows easily from that, given the, that the fusion al algebra is trivial for the yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. I like to think of this as a, as a GKO quotient. Well, if yes. Tilde might not be anomaly free. So I, it's very much like the GKO quotient, except in GKO, you had an affine Lie algebra and a subalgebra. Whereas here, we don't have any dimension one operators. So it's a generalization to that, but where the stress tensor and the primary field, primary dimension two operators are not bilinears in currents. Well, I mean, I could do something like a, take a dykegraff witten theory for the monster group and then gauge G. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, 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 think, I think you're right that it probably follows trivially and I'm just a little too um, buzzed out to say how clearly. So I hope you'll let me just go on. Uh, can I actually ask a uh, related, maybe a related question? Uh, is the stage of the tensor categories of chiral algebras W, G, W, tilde are equivalent or? So well, they're not, well, in, the, in many cases, they're not equivalent, but they are um, Galois images of each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So in the paper, we use three main techniques to compute these characters. Um, one, uh, Rademacher sums, which are essentially regularized Poincaré series, where you specify the polar ports and the modular properties, and then um, can you know, compute the Q expansion to whatever order you want, if you have sufficient computing power. Um, and that's certainly the most powerful and universal approach that we used. Um, we also use the theory of modular linear differential equations, where you look at differential equations for the character that the characters obey, equations in differentials in tau with coefficients that are modular forms, and HECA operators. And although HECA operators was not the most universal, I think it maybe is the most interest to number theorists. So I'm going to focus on that. It's also connected to earlier work that I did, so I just kind of have a fondness for it. So I hope I'll be excused by basically focusing on that particular aspect of it. So the, as I said earlier, the characters of a rational conformal field theory are weakly holomorphic modular forms for gamma n. And it's possible to adapt hack operators for gamma n to act on vector valued modular forms associated to a finite dimensional representation rho of SL2z. And the general construction appears in an earlier paper that I wrote with Yushu, Yushao Wu. And it can be formulated in the usual kind of double coset language that's used for HECA operators. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I suppose that there's a beautiful adelic explanation of the form that Matt was referring to, which is something that I would eventually like to understand, but I, I don't yet. But anyway, for computational purposes, there's a very uh, lowbrow formula, which just tells you how the operator acts on the Fourier coefficients. And that's the most useful for the actual concrete computations that we did. So since um, we're looking at theories that have conductor capital N, the characters always have a Q expansion in powers of Q to the one over N with some coefficients bi of little n. And if the chi i's with this Q expansion are characters conformal field theory with conductor n and modular representation rho, and if p is a prime, then you can define a HECA operator tp acting on the characters, and it has a Q expansion with the same conductor capital N, but with new coefficients, bi with a little superscript p to indicate the prime of the HECA operator, and these coefficients bip are P times bi of pn if p does not divide n, and 
P times BI of PN plus a term involving the representation rho of a certain matrix sigma P, which I'll define for you, BJ of N over P when P divides N. And if you're familiar with the usual formula for uh, HECA images given in terms of Fourier coefficients, there are two things worth noting. One is that I'm using a different overall power of P than is conventional, but it's what you want in rational conformal field theory to get integer um, coefficients. And it's irrelevant really, just mathematically, but it's nice physically. And the second thing is that there's a new element here, which is related to the fact that there's a non-trivial representation and that these chi i's are vector valued modular forms in that there's an in general off diagonal term here where the coefficients bj are converted into coefficients bi by the representation rho ij of a particular element of the modular group. So to completely define this, I have to not tell you what sigma p is. And it is the pre-image of the element of SL2z, p bar 0, 0, p, under the mod n map from SL2z to SL2z mod nz. And p bar here is the image of p mod n. So that's a certain amount to process, but anyway, here's an example. So if n is 60, p is 7, 7 times 43 is 1 mod 60. And you can check that this matrix is equal to uh, 43, yeah. 7 on the diagonal mod 60 and is an element of SL2Z. So just to check, there's a typo here. Image means inverse. Sorry? P bar, P bar is the inverse of P mod N. I'm sorry, yeah. That is yeah. That, I don't know if that was autocorrect or my brain flaking out, but yes, it's the inverse of P mod N. And finally, I should say that the definition I gave here was for P prime, but as usual for HEC operators, you can define HEC operators for P non prime by using the prime decom uh, decomposition into product of primes. But the particular definition that I've given here only works when P is relatively prime to N, which doesn't require that P be prime, but it does require that it be relatively prime to N. Um, I suspect that there's a generalization that goes beyond this case, but I don't really understand what it is. I'm oh, sorry, may I? I just want to uh, clarify. What, so you start with the uh, modular forms on gamma n, and then um, you're somehow looking at Hecke operators acting on uh, vector valued modular forms on SL2z. Yeah. With... Right, so these. So when you write, so if chi i equals this thing, this is, uh, this is not a vector valued modular form. This is still on gamma n. Well, chi i is by itself for a fixed i is a modular form on gamma n. Right. But under SL to Z mod gamma n, it transforms according to the representation rho into the other components of this vector valued modular form. Right. And the same thing is true of its Hecke image, right. but the but the representation changes in a way that I'll describe. I see for each Hecke operator p, for each. Uh... Yeah. So this, this these Hecke operators take vector valued modular forms to vector valued modular forms, mm -hmm. but they change the representation in a particular way that I'll describe. Cool. Um, and they satisfy the standard properties that you have of uh, Hecke operators on uh, modular forms as well. That I mean, yes. the form of yeah. the algebra. So, so maybe this one way you can describe it, I think, which maybe clarifies the passage between the gamma n and SL2z, is you could think that you have these, you have can look at functions from the upper half plane mod gamma n to scalars. And then sort of by just doing like a, like a Fabianian reciprocity, you can think, you can kind of, be, could you write those as some sort of functions from the upper half plane mod SL2z, but they're taking values now in some kind of vector bundle or something, which is exactly some kind of, regular representation of the quotient SL2z mod nz. And then, you're, and then uh, Jeff is taking a particular row, so a particular irreducible piece. And he's kind of saying his vectors are living, his functions are kind of giving a basis for that particular sub bundle. And I then see. you kind of just follow your nose to define the TPs. It's, I mean, somehow very, these TPs are like a very canonical thing. 
So in this terms, uh, uh, does there exist a basis of sections of this vector bundle which are Hecke eigen? I mean, he, here there won't be. I mean, if we were doing usual modular forms with a weight, you could do the same story and then the answer would be yes. Uh -huh. But here, I think as was pointed out in a previous talk, because these are going to be quasi-holomorphic, I guess sort of no, right? Because the pole gets worse when you apply. Right. 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 So TP takes a term Q to the minus alpha to Q to the minus P alpha. Right. Okay. So, we'll yeah. So I guess you could work in a, in a world of um, vector valued cusp forms for gamma n or something like that. And then I, I presume you could construct uh, heck eigenforms, but that's yeah. not the world we're in. in here. Okay. I mean, because of the polar part. Because of the polar part, exactly. So we're not going to find eigenforms, but we're going to find that the Hecke images are often interesting. All right. So, um, so as I said, the modular representation of the characters that you get under that are the Hecke images is not necessarily the same as the original representation. Rather, it, you can show that it's the image of the original representation under the Frobenius element FP. So in other words, you take your representation, you write all the elements in the representation as sums of nth roots of unity, and then you replace C to the n by C to the n to the p. And you can prove that that, um, that that is what this heck operator does. It changes the representation by this particular Frobenius element. So this is a kind of link in rational conformal field theory world between heck operators and Galois theory. And I know there are links between these things in the world of number theory, but I have no idea whether there's a connection between this link and those links. As far as I understand them, it looks quite different, but I don't know, it's kind of intriguing that the same ingredients are appearing. That's actually, uh, so I have a question. Is there a um, Eichler Shimura uh, relation for vector valued modular forms? Uh, not that I know of, but maybe somebody else knows. I mean, they, if we were doing cast forms, you know, cast forms or, I mean, holomorphic modular forms, then yes. But uh, in this weekly modular case, um, you do have these kind of different integrals that Zagier writes down and so on, but it, it's not, not quite in the same way, I don't think. I see. So this, this Galois theory action from RCFT is really new. I mean, it's not to be found in number theory books. Uh, I mean, I think, no, I think this would uh, also be... Um, I mean, I think it's just again, a new I, application I, 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 of, of standard... Galois theory. I mean, it's not. Yeah, I, mean, I think that I, I think the main difference between this setup and, and a usual setup is that um, people. I mean, the usual setup of people who would study this kind of say vector value modular form context wouldn't be doing weakly holomorphic modular forms. So I think that's the kind of most the biggest difference between this and what you would find in um, I don't know papers of, of number theorists doing Langland stuff is. You, they, they wouldn't be thinking about heck operators on weekly holomorphic modular forms because they wouldn't, you know, they'd be looking, it's, just a, it's a sort of different world. I think it's, um, mm -hmm. it's producing different objects for different purposes, I would say. I mean, I guess I would say the other, the other main difference is that, you know, as we heard in Matt's talk, um, in the Langlands world, the coefficients of modular forms are usually counting solutions to Diophantine equations. Right. Whereas in this world, they're, characters of sporadic groups. Right. Finite groups. That was actually, I mean, uh, so this is going back to Matt's talk. There is no uh, Motevic picture or Galois, uh, or sorry, Langland's correspondence for weight zero modular forms? Well, again, to be holomorphic, yeah. it's, it's kind of, the, there's only the trivial modular form basically. And so there's not really, I mean, the question becomes kind of almost vacuous. And mm -hmm. if you want interesting weight zero objects, then you have to, um, Pull allow down. poles and then uh, and in some contexts people do you can study those you, you can connect um where so zero are, are there are uh, there conjectures which relate galois representations to uh, weakly holomorphic modular forms 
so maybe there's a, the, the kind of short answer is no, but there's a sort of maybe more subtle answer where it could be yes, but it, but, but that, but I, in, in some sense, but maybe you should we'll let Jeff finish and then. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. I just have a couple of slides left. So, um, cause I think I'm running short of time, so I apologize for that, but I'll finish up. So, uh, under these, under these heck operators, um, if you start with a with characters of a of a rational conformal field theory with central charge C, then you'll get a theory with central charge P times C, and that's a typo. I apologize for that. It rescales the central charge by P. Um, and there's an interesting pattern that occurs in many of the examples that we've looked at of monster deconstruction, and that pattern is the following. Let P be the largest prime dividing the order of a sporadic group G that's involved in the monster. Then in a number of examples, we find that the characters of the VOA with automorphism group G are Hecke images under TP, where P is this prime, the largest prime dividing the order, of the characters of a much simpler rational conformal field theory of the type that I was discussing. So I'll give you two examples. So the baby monster uh, CFT with central charge 47 over two is one of the first examples of this kind of procedure. 47 is the largest prime dividing the baby monster. And if you take the icing model characters that I wrote down before in terms of those Jacobi theta functions and Dedekind eta function, and you apply T47, you get these three characters and these are precisely the characters of the baby monster. So the baby monster are Hecke images of the icing model. Characters are Hecke images of the icing model. There is a C equals 29 times 4 fifth VOA with Fisher 24 symmetry. And its characters are Hecke images under T29 um, of, I shouldn't have said icing model. I really, my brain was asleep when I was making these slides. Uh, not the icing model, but they're images of the C equals four fifth um, three state POTS model, which is also known as the Z3 parafermion. It's also a minimal model. Uh, and 29 is the largest prime dividing the order of Fisher 24. So these kind of complicated things where if you're a group theory aficionado, you can recognize things like 4371 as the dimension of one of the irreducible representations of the baby monster or 783 is one of the irreducible representations of Fisher 24. All these coefficients with these nice decompositions arise from heck images of very simple things. There are some other examples that are given in our paper and some other examples beyond that were worked out in some unpublished work. I find this connection fascinating, but we don't have a good connect, uh, conceptual explanation or really any explanation of why this should be true, why these complicated things. I mean, I guess there's a partial explanation, maybe just in that there are only so many finite dimensional representations of these groups, as Matt was saying. And you know the heck image has to take you to something of the same, a representation of the same dimension. So maybe it sort of has to work, but it's nonetheless kind of striking to me that you can get these large coefficients associated with irreducible representations of large groups in such a simple way. All right, so let me end with a little summary and comments. Um, for nine of the sporadic groups involved in M, we gave constructions of this form. I think it could probably be extended to many of the other groups. I don't know if it can be extended to all of them that are involved in the monster, but it seems quite possible. If so, it would be a nice uniform way of understanding sort of, well, these are symmetry groups of all sorts of exotic combinatoric things, but it would give all of them a home in the land of CFT and VOAs. Uh, we used various techniques. There's moonshine in way to half, which has also been of much interest in the last few years. Matthew and umbral moonshine for mock modular forms of way to half involving the Matthew group and other groups. And there's been uh, moonshine in way to half involving some forms that were originally studied by Borchers and, and by Zage that involve the Thompson group and uh, have been extended in some work that hopefully will appear at some point by Brandon and John Duncan and I. 
But this moonshine is not that moonshine as far as we can tell. That is, there are certain representations that occur at low orders in one that simply don't occur until very high orders in the other. And they seem to have very different characters. And finally, as a string theorist, it'd be fun to explore the use of some of these in stringy constructions to see if we could give string theory backgrounds with monster subgroup symmetry. Um, in some cases, those constructions are kind of similar to or related to some constructions that Greg and I looked at involving Conway subgroup symmetric compactifications uh, in string theory. So I will end there and apologies for going over. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you very much. Well, as usual, so we'll move on to the, the question session where everybody, anybody who has to leave can leave. And Greg, you have a question, I guess? Um, yeah. Um, so I think I've asked you this a few times before, but maybe there's been progress. Um, so can your HECI action, HECI operator action on the characters of RCFTs be upgraded to a functor from one modular tensor category to another? Um, I don't know that that's true in general, but it is true in a number of special cases where there are a finite number of um, channels in the so fusion the category. Full, the, full, the, full modular category the full modular tensor category. I know in your paper, you showed that acting with the HECI operate, your HECI operator action on characters from one RCFT gave you characters in another RCFT. Do I have that right? Yeah, right, but there's, a, there's another paper which you may not have looked at um, uh, where we investigated whether the HECI operator um, gave us a map between modular tensor categories as well. And Although we were not able to establish it in general, we were able to establish it for a number of examples and a few general cases, as long as there weren't too many elements in the fusion. Right, that was with your student in December or something like that. Yeah. Um, and, but did, are there cases where it doesn't work or, or is it just no. that, as far as you know, it I don't, will always work? I don't know cases where it doesn't work. I just don't know a proof. I mean, I guess in principle, in principle, one would try to take those pentagon and hexagon identities and show that there's some kind of action that, you know, by HECA operators that gives you another solution. But okay, I don't, I don't know how to do that. And, and but and a follow-up question. I mean, it would be really nice if there was an interpretation in terms of Chern Simons theory, right? Because you know, we could we could think about dykroff witten theories for the Conway group, uh, or sorry, the monster group. So. Yeah, I, I would love to find that, and I've thought about it a little bit, um, and I could tell you what I've tried to do, but so far it hasn't worked. Can I ask, I have, I have two possibly naive questions. Sure. Um, and so, and they're both sort of of the form, is this related to this other thing? And the answer is usually kind of, well, maybe. So with that said, one of them is, um, I've seen older papers that, are, that recognize the genus zero properties in monstrous moonshine as being related to HECA multiple, like kind of replicability. And I'm wondering, is that the same, um, the same phenomenon you're finding? Well, the HECA repl replicability there is not, does not involve HECA operators on vector valued modular forms as far as I understand it. Um, it's, uh, um, anyway, I guess the short answer is, uh, I, I don't know of a connection. Okay. And the other, the other question I wanted to ask was, um, in old work of Borchards and Riba and then Borchards, they, um, took the monster group um, they took an integral form of them and then like finished by Carnahan. They took a, the monster VOA, they took an integral form of it, and then they um, wrote down the take cohomology for various elements of them um, acting on that, which is something like the twisted sector for those elements, but thought of over the prime peak. 
And they wrote down the character of that and said, well, this is a vertex algebra. It's not the right one, um, but it, or it wasn't, a, but it looked like um, interesting integral vertex algebras after rescaling Q by some power. So it was like they were producing, so they could produce the character of, of Conway Moonshine, for instance, from the, from that construction. Uh -huh. I didn't know if that was somehow the same, secretly a similar construction as yours. Again, I don't really think I can answer because I don't understand that work well enough, but I wouldn't be surprised if, the, if there's an eventual understanding of these HECA operators, if they, I wouldn't be surprised if, if such an understanding involved trying to look at CFTs over fields other than C. Um, but, um, but yeah, so again, I don't really know for sure. Sorry, could I ask a little bit about what you were saying about uh, digraph Witten, what, what the two of you were saying. Sure, I mean, why, don't you ask, why don't you ask Greg because he knows more about that than I do. Yeah, but you said you tried to do something with it as well. I mean, what did it supposed to do for you? In oh, this I point? was just trying, I was just, I tried to understand these HECA operators in terms of churn simons theory. So there's a oh, connection between, if you, if you have churn simons theory, mm -hmm. the three-dimensional theory in the bulk, right. and there's a conformal field theory that describes the modes that live on the edge of that three-dimensional sure. surface. And I think there's a conjecture that, I don't know, if Greg can tell me, who, tell you who it's by, but I think he and Nadi had a conjecture, and I think Ed has a conjecture that essentially you can get all rational conformal field theories from churn simons theory one way or the other. So, if that's true, and we're finding relationships between different conformal field theory characters using HECA operators, then it suggests that there ought to be some way of acting with these HECA operators directly on the churn simons theory. So I think that's what he was ask, asking. I can, give you, I can give you an example. Sure. By the operators are to take affine A1 at level one and affine E7 at level one turns out that there's a T7 HEC operator that relates the characters of those two theories. But it's really not at all clear how churn simons theory at level Jeff, one. Jeff, with your sound, Jeff, your sound cut out at a critical point. Something about uh, affine, affine. All right, I, was, I was saying affine A1 at level one and affine E7 at level one have characters that are related by a HEC operator, T7. Mm -hmm. But it's so it's so you could ask yourself: Is there some action of some HECA-like thing or something that generalizes HECA on the churn simons theory with gauge group SU two at level one, relating that to gauge group E seven at level one? I don't know. I mean, I think that's what Greg is asking about: Is there some way of letting yes. the yeah, HECA yeah. or a generalization of them act directly on on churn simons theory? Yes, it sounds like a very quantum symmetry because I doubt that there's anything we would see at the classical level of churn simons. Yeah, yeah. So it's a, I think it's a great question, but I don't know the answer. I don't know. But actually, Min Young has this whole theory of arithmetic churn simons, so that might be. A yeah. Thing. So maybe he knows what to do. Well, I don't know, but it, so that question, but that's more or less the same question as whether or not the Hecke operators act on the modular tensor categories. I guess, right? Yes, that's why I put it that way first. Yeah. 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 Uh, but the, is it that you expect thinking of it in terms of churn simons as being somehow more natural than directly looking at this VOA? That it will explain it in some way? Is that what you're expecting? Well, yeah. as Edward Witten famously pointed out for some <laughs> aspects of the connections between uh, rational conformal field theory and mathematics, the churn simons theory point of view is superior. For oh, example, is that right? So he asked that. I didn't know that. <laughs> I see. Well, I don't know. You know, Ed may or may, or may not be right. He's usually right, but not always. Um, but in any event, I would like to, yeah, I don't really understand the origin of these. And I'm, I'm open to any other point of view that might help explain why there are these relations. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
so kind of more um like my first reaction that's you know not knowing anything from the physics point of view or even really barely anything from the voa point of view was the kind of um mass, most parsimonious explanation which is this kind of a uh, small dimension explanation that in some sense you can maybe filter these weakly holomorphic modular forms by the order of pole of the cusps and for low pole orders and low levels i mean the dimensions must be fairly small and the more so because they're being organized kind of in these representations so even you know the dimensions are small and maybe you know you have a various guys that are being kind of organized together because there's some sort of SL2Z representation on them so that so that that's breaking up things into even smaller pieces mm -hmm. so then so so on the one hand if you just think about these heck operators it just seems like you know sometimes something interesting maybe a bit simpler we'll have to hit something else maybe interesting but like slightly worse pole order and slightly more complicated just because of some kind of pigeonhole principle basically so that was kind of the most like kind of uninteresting explanation that that jeff offered that well since there are so many of these things floating around um maybe sometimes it has to be kind of coincidental relationships under heck operators so that was kind of i don't know that was that's my kind of first yeah i think that my first that impression yeah, that would, that, that would be the simplest and probably the least interesting explanation. And I, and I think it could be explored I by... Thing... Go okay. ahead, I'm sorry. I just, what I was just going to say, I think one thing that's kind of not as clear from that point of view, though, is I guess I don't have a sense, but you probably do, of which of these things actually appear as characters. Like, as you said, they need positive integer coefficients. I mean, this. Like in some sense, it can, this character condition is not even, they're not, it's not even a sub, like it's not even a linear condition because you need integer coefficients and they need to be positive integer coefficients and so on. So, I mean, the fact that a heck operator is ca taking a character to a, or a collection of characters to a collection of characters seems to kind of, I mean, that seems to go against this kind of like least interesting explanation and kind of hint at closer to, to what, if Matt, if that, if that point of view were right, then you would expect that the uh, correspondence that Jeff is finding would start to fail as the dimensions get a little bigger. Mm. And, and do you know what happened? Like, where, do you have, um, I mean, I don't have a sense of like how, how big or small the spaces involved are at the various levels and sort of pole orders that that you're looking at, Jeff, but do you have a sense of, of getting such relationships in a situation where it looks... I, I, only have an ex I only have a little bit of experiment. Yeah, I only have a little bit of experimental information. Uh, I mean, in these moonshine examples, I think some of the examples we were looking at were six or seven dimensional representations, which may be starting to get big enough that you would start to think there should be a lot of room to maneuver, but we still ended up on some special things. But I think it could be explored more systematically, and we just haven't done that. I mean, the question of um, how big the space of representations is and, um, you know, to what degree that forces you to land on something interesting. Mm -hmm. um, just a, a comment is that um, Nora Ganter in some of her work looked at sort of explain that, that one version of heck operators um, the heck operators in can be interpreted in elliptic cohomology as power operators and so um, so some of the time you get kind of integrality somehow automatically from it being a power operator in topology yeah and but it's not explaining what Jeff was explaining because the group is changing under the heck operators so it's totally not that no I mean the the point about so doesn't ADS CFT well ADS three CFT two duality also tell you that there should be a Hecke uh, action on uh, a gauge theory living in the ADS three bulk? Well, uh, you know ADS CFT for small central charge is is kind of a controversial subject. The I don't know maybe Greg has something to say about it, but. It's, it's really understood precisely only for very large central charge conformal field theories that have some special properties. So, you know, whether there is a CFT dual of the 
monster VO, an ADS-3 dual of the monster VOA is very much an open question. I see. Yeah. Okay. But um, just just to check, right now though, am I right that you don't really know that these HEF operators are in some sense even a symmetry of the CFT picture? That's part of the question being asked, right? Like right now, you know that they're a symmetry of the characters and you have examples where they kind of are really, where the character, where they are, well, they're, I mean, they're symmetry of the modular forms. And then you have situations where you apply them to characters and you get other characters. But my understanding was that that fact that right now looks kind of, miraculous rather than explained. Or yeah, I don't think they are. I mean, well, I don't know what it would mean to say it's a symmetry that relates affine A1 to affine E7. Mm -hmm. I mean, how can that be that those two CFTs just have different symmetry groups? I mean, they can't possibly be the same in any real sense. But maybe there's some other, you know, maybe there's some way of modifying them or changing them or defining them over a piatic field or something in which, where these things do become symmetries and then can somehow explain what we're finding. But just at the level I've presented, they are not, I would not call them symmetries of rational conformal field theories. They just relate characters of certain theories. Mm -hmm. And I think um, uh, an optimistic guess would be that there would be a, a set of functors between modular tensor categories satisfying something like a Hecke algebra at a functorial level. But yeah, but, but you don't really need characters for a modular tensor category, right, Greg? Uh, that's true. That's true. That's well, true. So that, the that, there's more, there, there has to be a little bit more than that because that could, I mean, basically that's the Galois action that is relating the modular tensor categories because you just need to relate the, you know, the fusion and braiding. Okay, that's okay. a good point. You're, yes, yes, that's an excellent. But, but these are acting on characters, which is more data than in a, in a modular tensor category. So, sorry, can I just make one small point? Uh, I just want to emphasize one thing, which is that um, in, in general, I agree that um, when you can express the characters of one RCFT as Hecke images of, of the other, you, you don't in general know, you know, whether they're tensor categories or equivalent or whatever. Um, but I think one of the nice things about what what Jeff was illustrating in this talk is that in some cases you are precisely able to relate the the characters of RCFTs because they occur as a commutant pair inside of a larger CFT and in those cases there is I think you can say a lot more so I think um, maybe one thing to keep in mind which I think would inform a lot of the questions is that occasionally and maybe in all examples I'm not sure that whenever you can relate characters of RCFTs with the HEC operators, <laughs> that it might be because they occur as commutant pairs. Do I have a general knowledge question? Is it known if can there's I ask, a, sorry. Is it known if there's a field extension of Q whose Galois group is the monster group? Mm. I think that's known. Isn't every finite group a Galois group? Well, no, not right. a few over. But it's surely true, yeah. but it's not proved. But for the monster group, I think it's known, but it's not very interesting. I think there's a paper of Thompson that does that, but it's not. I the construction yes. is not very illuminating. I think it's. Um, I mean, I think those constructions, often people do this with some kind of Hilbert irreducibility. They make a kind of uh, a more geometric setting with that symmetry, and then they specialize over some like affine line maybe and then you choose particular points in the base and you get you know you get um things and maybe my memory is to thompson's argument is something like this right in town like it's close to hilbert irreducibility style argument yeah, it's something like that but i think it, 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 i once tried to look at it's very combinatorial somehow it was hard to ah so, so I, I mean, but if one understands that field and uh its subfields then maybe the uh, sub uh, voas that are sitting inside the monster voas are easier to understand or classify i'm not sure that, but that, i mean those field there'll be lots of such fields in some sense and um i mean you know sort of yeah i don't know i'm not sure that there's sort of i mean there'll be lots of such fields and it's not clear I think exactly, I mean, the group theory of the, of the monster would be more likely to tell you about the subfield structure, I think, than maybe vice versa. That, that would just be my kind of intuition. I see. 
Um, just because it would be a bit like saying, if you look at fields whose symmetry group is S5, then you're looking at quintics. And in some sense, like how, you know, people tried to solve quintics and couldn't get anywhere until they understood the connection with S5. And then it's the subgroup structure of S5 is what gives you information about how to solve quintics. Mm. In some sense, rather than the other direction. Um, but so, Jeff, I was kind of curious. Yeah, no, this is, so so Jeff, just because you, you, you had some of these examples where you applied a particular heck operator and got a connection between two characters, but do you, what if I choose a prime and then I apply the heck operator mm -hmm. for that prime that I chose? Like, do I, then do I hit characters of something? Like are, are there particular primes being singled out because of their divisibility of orders of groups? Or if I choose other primes and can I hope can I hope that I might also be getting some kind of VOA that's just not connected directly to the monster or? Um, so you can, you can get junk when you act with, and it, with just some random TP, meaning uh -huh. you can get some characters, there'll be a representation of the modular group, but when you compute the fusion coefficients from the Verlinda formula, you'll find some negative integers. Uh, that's quite common. If you act with TP for a prime that is too large, then what happens is you get a character, it's called a character, but it has too large a gap between the most singular power of Q and the next power of Q. Because in a conformal field theory, you always have a descendant under L minus two of the vacuum. And so you're only allowed, allowed to have a gap of a power of Q squared between the most negative term and the next term. So it's more like there are a small number of Qs, a small number of Ps, where the Hecke image is consistent with the structure of conformal field theory. And out of that set, there's only a subset that's consistent, well, that's consistent with this gap, and then a smaller subset that's consistent with integer fusion coefficients. Uh -huh. um, so it's, yeah, so there are only particular primes that seem to work. And in the monster case, those primes, for some reason, are the are related to primes dividing the orders of sporadic groups. Uh -huh. Thanks. Can I ask a question? It's, a, sure. it's sort of a change of topic. So, the, Pavel Gurjoy and um, Katrin Bringman and these people, um, maybe others, maybe Francis Brown. Um, I mean, they have this idea that you can have a weakly holomorphic model of forms, so with, with some pole, but nevertheless, there's some projection. So, so imagine weakly holomorphic model of forms which don't have constant terms, and then, um, then this equation, which is roughly being a total derivative, um, and then there's a, there's a projection, there's a quotient um, with that relation with which they define cusp like forms, so weakly cusp forms. Yeah, and you can make Hecke eigenforms that, that way by way. Exactly, you can make Hecke eigenforms. Of, uh, yeah, so is that, I mean, can you sort of, does that apply here? Is there, is there any sense of eigenforms? Well, in your thing? I, I looked a little bit at some of their papers. It seems to work best when the weight is greater than zero. Their formulas right. become kind of degenerate for weight zero. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't really make sense of anything useful um, I see. I'm not saying there isn't something useful to be said that way, but mm -hmm. I gave a talk and Francis mentioned that to me and I took a look at his paper and I see. tried to apply it here, but I didn't really get anywhere. I see. Okay. But yeah, at higher weight, you can definitely, I think you look at, um, you look at Hecke images, but then you do it modulo forms that are D of some exactly, exactly. lower so, weight yeah, form. Yeah. That's and then right. in that That's space right. with that quotient, you can make high exactly. like eigenforms. Yeah, um, you have to use Bohr's identity or something like that. And yeah, that's right. It uses, uses mm -hmm. Bohr's identity, yeah, yeah. but I, yeah. I couldn't make it work at weight zero in a way that seemed useful in rational conformal so, uh, really, uh, uh, If you think of uh, these VOAs in terms of uh, rational conformal field theories, uh, the later correspond to uh, finite rank uh, holomorphic vector bundles on the modular curve. And is there a condition on them that how they should extend to the cusps? 
because there it seems that they're flat sections which should be these characters have uh, poles of high order they're not just a logarithmic extension which is the usual thing to do well i think you can prove um in con rational conformal field theory that you can only have poles at the cusp at i infinity um i think you can prove it's convergent at other cusps aha uh -huh. greg do you know if that's true or is greg gone I think Greg's gone. I believe, no, I think no, Greg is still I'm there. Here, I, I'm here in body, but I was actually distracted. What was the question? I, I, I was saying, I think you can prove that the only cusp, the only uh, poles in the characters of a rational conformal field theory are at the cusp at I infinity, that you can prove that the series converges at other cusps. Do you know I, if that's I, correct? No, I don't. I, 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 well, you, you mentioned that in your talk, and I actually that popped a question mark in my mind, and I, I'm not sure about that. I mean, we can look at an example. Is that really right? I mean, I just, I, I'm thinking more about the various modular forms you get in the U plane, where it's definitely not true, but maybe they're not. Well, Actually, they are related to two-dimensional two-dimensional quantum field theories. So, yeah, yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure about that. I, I seem to remember that that's true, but I'm I, I, I'm not able to reconstruct the argument right now. So, um, um, I can yeah send me an email if you want, and I'll, if I can figure out why I thought why I said that, I can let you know. <laughs> Uh, I, th I think I read an argument of that form at some point, but I'm, it's, I'm blanking on where or why. Thank you. Uh, one, I mean, only if nobody else has questions about the talk. i just interested because you mentioned the use of uh, MLDEs. Yeah. How, only if, an, I mean, only if you want to answer how, or uh, maybe briefly, uh, how are they used or? <coughs> well, so, suppose you want to find a two-dimensional rep. You want to find a vector value modular form that forms a uh, two-dimensional representation of the modular group. Mm -hmm. So you write down a second order differential equation for the characters, d squared by d tau squared plus, um, and then you need, well, you, I guess there are two ways that you can, you can write it, you can write derivatives in terms of the, um, I guess it's the Ramanujan Serre derivative, d by d tau minus, Minus k over 12 e2. Yeah, right. So, but, but if we're acting in weight zero, uh, then that, k that term is vanished. But then you yeah. can act with d squared. So then you need that term acting on d again. So if you define iterated d in that way, so that d chi is now weight two, so d acting on again has that term, then you can write down a differential equation that involves d squared tau. And then you can have a constant term that would have to be a modular form of weight four, so that would be E4. So mm -hmm. you could have a differential equation that looked like D squared chi plus some coefficient times E4 chi is equal to zero. So that would be a modular differential equation. And by you know, general arguments that, um, I mean, if you want, you could map that I guess to the J plane where you have singularities at zero, one and infinity, and then you have monodromy mm -hmm. that tells you that the two solutions transform into each other under the action of SL2Z. And you can look for coefficient, the undetermined coefficients such that the solutions have integer coefficients. Mm -hmm. And that was that particular case where you look for um, two-dimensional representations that could be characters of rational conformal field theory was worked out in a paper by Mathur, Mookie, and Sen. I can send you the reference if you want. And it's been um, generalized to higher order equations in the context of rational conformal field theory. And I think there's also a paper by Mason and somebody that, that uses it as a tool for discussing the structure of vector-valued modular forms. I see. 
Hi, Jeff. Can I ask a question? Hey, my... Hello? Yeah? Chris? So, sorry, yeah. Um, I, got, I, I tried to jump in with the question earlier, and then my computer crashed. So this is a little bit delayed, and I hope somebody didn't already ask it or you didn't already answer it. But uh, you, were, you were talking about what happens if you ask if you, if you act with general AK operators on some of your on some of your characters, and you're saying right. like nonsense with negative integer fusion rules, but so if you if you relax your attention to rational conformal field theories, there's all sorts of great vertex operator algebras that have negative coefficients that you compute their naive fusion rules. Yeah, with the S matrix. So could some of these things that you're getting be characters of vertex algebras that are not rational CFTs? Yeah, so yes, I mean, there are interesting things um, beyond the standard rational conformal field theories. So, so for example, at the, just at the level of, of theories that have two characters, there's a representation of the modular group that actually Mathur, Mookie, and Sen found by looking at um, the mod, second order modular linear differential equation, which they called E7 and a half. Um, which I think is related to some earlier work by um, Deline. There's something called the Deline Exceptional Series, um, which kind of has a gap between e E7 and E8 that you can fill by something called E7 and a half. And that it's a it's not a standard VOA, but it's a modified kind of thing where you quotient out by some space of states. I think including the conformal vector and um, but it has characters and it has negative integer fusion coefficients and its characters are heca images of simpler cfts or smaller central charge cfts so it's true that you can get characters of other things by this method um, okay thanks i would i weirdly i'm familiar with this e seven and a half thing but um, you can even get, I mean, even more conventional vertex algebras that just don't correspond to RCFTs, but which are honest to God vertex operator algebras can give you these negative integer coefficients. You get it for the so-called admissible level um, F and Katz Moody VOAs. Right, which right. Are negative fractional levels that are, uh, they're not, not rational, but they have some nice properties. Yeah, yeah, and um, right, and and there's all your work on the relationship of those things to um, n equals super conformal field theories in four dimensions. So it would be really interesting to understand whether there's some extension of these kinds of ideas in that context. Wait, so two th sorry, my, uh, my computer started uh, behaving badly, so I missed uh, the uh, MLDE's con uh, conversation, but this was the the thing that you said at the end is really it's, it's a N two D four QFT. Yeah, I mean Chris is the Chris Beam is the expert on this, but there mm -hmm. is there's a relationship between two dimensional, uh, well, certain uh, certain affine Lie algebras, but at fractional level mm -hmm. in uh, two dimensions and um, a particular sector of four dimensional theories with n equals two super conformal symmetry. So these uh, in particular, this sector can be explained for class S theories? Well, why doesn't Chris answer your question because he really knows much more about this than I do. Uh. Yeah, there's a, view, there's a beautiful construction at class S and in fact, it's now a part of rigorous mathematics due to well, Tomoyuki uh, Arakawa. Yeah, please say that. Can you please repeat the names? Tomoyuki Arakawa has written a paper um, called Chiral, Al Chiral Algebras of Class S and uh, More Tachikawa Symplectic Varieties, which does a lot of great things, but it, um, it, it gives a rigorous, it gives a rigorous but hard for a physicist to follow construction of the, of the Class S um, vertex algebras. Mm -hmm. We have some more we, we have some less high powered, but more followable by mortals. Um, <laughs> okay. Of, of, of those things in a, in a paper that, that we wrote called Chiral Algebras of Class S. Um, I see, cool. Is it, uh, wow. Thanks, that's very uh, 
Hey, Greg is saying it's hard to hear you if you want to repeat. I'm sorry. I, I hope it's better now. I'm trying to adjust my volume. Um, so, saying, sorry, can I ask you a question? Oh, go ahead. I was just going to repeat myself because Greg said it was hard to hear me, which is to say that there is a really fantastic piece of work by Tomoyuki Arakawa called Carol Algebras of Class S and More Tachikawa Symplectic Varieties um, that, that gave a very, a very rigorous but very formal looking construction of a bunch of vertex operator algebras um, that are associated to class S theories. Um, and I'm going to write the name of the author in the, in the chat box. So how how old is this paper? Uh, Arakawa's paper is from um, a handful of years ago. Maybe it's two or three years old by now. Um, and then there's an older paper by um, Leonardo Ristelli and myself and uh, and Walt von Reis and Wolfgar Pilers, where we studied these so, things so in, this more, is, this in a is more exactly hands-on way. Is this exactly the same chiral algebra you constructed with Leonardo and, and Wolfgar? It's exactly the same construction, or except that he actually constructs them in complete generality for all of for the T n for all n, um, and uh, and he also show using his construction he shows that the um, the associated variety of these vertex algebras, which is there's some they call the associated variety of a vertex right, operator algebra, right, right. which is a which is an algebraic variety that you can extract. Oh, um, wait, then you, then you could. I mean, and he, sh well, he I shows that the associated it, variety. You can apply Jeff's theory to your chiral algebras. Yes, I think it would. Uh, well, does that preserve does class it, S type uh, chiral algebras? I don't. I don't know. So class S, it, it, the sorts of the sorts of um, vector valued modular forms that you get for the class S theories. And actually, a bit more generally, pretty much for well, for conventional sort of class S theories with regular punctures, and also sort of more manifestly for um, the Grangian gauge theories, uh, you get things which are which are not quite vector valued modular forms. They're vector valued quasi modular forms, so they're um, okay, sure. They're, they're, they get they get log Qs in their transformations. It's like the it's like the the E two Eisenstein series in their transformation yeah. properties. Right, right. Um, so I, I imagine that there's something to do to try to get an even bigger generalization of this oh, story to these quasi-modular forms. That would be nice. But also there are, there are 40 theories that have, that don't give you the quasi-modular forms. So the, the ones that Jeff was mentioning, there's lots of Argyris Douglas type theories that yeah. give you, um, things like, things like admissible level affine Ketz Moody VOAs and ad admissible level other things that have, that have more conventional vector value modular forms. Okay, and if you apply Jeff's transformation to those?